Good afternoon, everyone. I am Nancy K. Blackwell, Executive Director of the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute. This is a very special day for us at CCAI. We look forward to this briefing each summer and are so happy that you joined us today. CCAI was created almost 20 years ago by advocates who envisioned an organization to educate Congress about the needs of children. CCAI collaborates with policymakers, experts in a wide range of modalities from child welfare to technology and a variety of program partners. We all have one goal in mind of having children grow up in loving families. CCAI's programs include the Congressional Resource Program, where we bring experts to educate Congress on emerging issues in child welfare, our Angels in Adoption Program, which is our annual fundraising event where we highlight work of citizens and organizations from around the country that have contributed to the permanency and safety of children through foster care and adoption. Our Angels event is this fall and will be a virtual event also. I hope you can join us. Our 2020 Vision Program facilitates communication, education, and fact-finding trips between government entities domestically and internationally. And lastly, our Foster Youth Intern Program, which is our flagship program that has brought you all here today. The FYI program began in 2003 as an effort to raise the voices of youth that have spent time in the United States foster care system to communicate to federal policymakers about the needs and unique perspectives of their lived experience. During this challenging time of COVID-19 pandemic, combined with this moment of rising awareness in this country of the issues of racial justice, equity, and inclusion, CCAI is honored to have chosen a group of former foster youth and adoptees to participate in our annual foster youth internship program. We struggled with weighing the safety of our interns traveling to DC to work on the Hill or staying put safely in their homes. We decided in late April to move our FYI program to a virtual platform. This summer, the FYIs have engaged in weekly panels from child welfare and policy experts to lay the groundwork for their critical thinking to, de to develop their policy reports. This year, our policy reports were focused on the impact of COVID-19 on foster youth and families. As the country shut down to protect the health of citizens, we relied on technology in ways that were not anticipated. Therefore, you will hear lots of discussion about technology and COVID-19. Additionally, we organized the presentations to create a story of foster youth and adoptees from the viewpoint of the individual, the family, and the system. The FYIs put a lot of thought and effort into developing their policy reports based on their own personal experience in child welfare and the foster care system. You will be presented with stories of struggle and triumph that culminate into recommendations for Congress to improve the system. Before we get started, I would like to thank our corporate sponsors, the Dave Thomas Foundation, the Carlson Family Foundation, ACLI, Brownstein Hyatt Farber at Shrek, Retail Orphans Initiatives, Integrated Legislative Strategies, the Bella Grazia Fund, Rita Lewis, Paul and Emily Singer Foundation, and the Walter Johnson Foundation. I would also like to thank our program partners, Child Focus and Arnold and Porter. I would also like to thank the CCAI Board of Directors, my amazing staff, Kate McLean, Taylor Drady, and Erica Briganti, and our summer interns, Samantha Brooks from George Washington University and Jesse Majors from Stanford University in Alabama. For today's briefing, feel free to tweet about this event using the following hashtags. Hashtag FYI 2020, hashtag fostering policy, hashtag focus on kids. Today we have a simple agenda, which will start with presentations from our FYI participants, a question and answer period following by our closing from our CCAI board chairwoman, Senator Mary Landrieu. Again, thank you for signing in today to participate. I will now pass it on to Ian Marks. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, and thank you for joining us. My name is Ian Marks and I am joined by the rest of the 2020 class of the Congressional Coalition Adoptions Institute, Foster Youth Internship Program, and the first ever 
Boss Youth Intern COVID-19 Pandemic Working Group. While we wish we could be presenting to you all in person, we are honored to have this platform to present our insights and recommendations regarding the current state of foster care and the ways in which the pandemic is impacting vulnerable children and families. Now, as young adults with lives outside of the foster care system, all 12 of us have never forgotten our individual experiences with the child welfare system have affected our perceptions of life and the challenges that we, and so many others, face every day. Using these experiences, each of us has spent months carefully selecting our research topic, conducting a thorough review of relevant government statutes, government programs, and child welfare funding streams to identify tangible ways for Congress, the administration, and states to address the faults in our system that have been significantly exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has affected each of our lives individually, but it has also turned the way our government cares for vulnerable children and families completely on its head. Our report analyzed four prominent areas in the foster care system, safety and stability, aging out and well-being, permanency, and the child welfare workforce. And our recommendations range from addressing the needs of individual youth and families to structural and systematic reform. We seek not only to address the challenges caused by the pandemic, but to be a catalyst for reform of the system that will impact all future generations of foster youth and families. We hope that everyone today can see the barriers that foster youth face, how those obstacles are exposed and amplified by COVID-19, and work with us to translate our recommendations into real-time policy change. Thank you all again for joining us, and I will now turn it over to my colleague, Taishé, to begin our Foster Youth recommendations. Greetings. It is an honor to be here virtually, and I am so thankful for this opportunity. My name is Tashe Roberson Wing, and I live in Ohio pursuing a master's in social work at The Ohio State University. I remember getting that first email from my university saying classes were moving online and dorms were closed due to COVID-19. In this moment, I knew that COVID-19 was a serious matter. For my safety, I went to be with my adopted parents. As I, as I traveled back to my parents' house, I could not stop thinking about the foster youth and homeless students who did not have a safe place to return to during this scary time. I thought about what it meant when the dorms closed for foster and homeless youth. I thought about my own experience. I thought about how in undergrad, I depended on the university for stable housing. When the dorms closed for breaks, I packed my car and drove with no destination. I couch surfed. For youth who depend on colleges for stable housing, the dorms closing can lead to homelessness. I cannot imagine being forced out of my dorm or couch serving during a pandemic. The sad reality is that for some foster youth and homeless students, this is their experience. COVID-19 has shed light on the need for housing for current and former foster youth. According to a poll conducted by Foster Club, a significant number of youth have been forced to leave their campus without the time, funds, or connections to alternative housing. The Higher Education Opportunity Act allows, but does not require participating institutions to fund housing or other supports for foster and homeless youth. Current law allows the Department of Ed to establish grants and contracts for institutions of higher ed to improve post-secondary education. The COVID-19 crisis has made it clear that educational institutions have work to do to provide adequate services for this population. Congress should meet their moral responsibility to current and former foster youth and amend Title VII of the Higher Education Opportunities Act to, a, to award formal grants to all states to provide housing, mental health support, and social and academic support for current and former foster youth plus homeless students pursuing post-secondary education. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Janali Merwin. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I first want to thank my son, Christian, loved ones, the entire team of CCAI, and foster youth leaders that were a part of this pandemic group. 
I entered the foster care system with my one month old son at the age of 15. I raised my son throughout the five years of his life until I aged out. My background being homelessness, gangs, drugs, and dysfunction. This was a life I never wanted for my son. While my life was chaotic, the truth is my son gave me a new beginning, which many did not understand. My son was never my obstacle. He was always my motivation. Looking back to the moments of uncertainty were terrifying. Not knowing what to do when my child was sick or how I was supposed to meet my child's basic needs. When I needed support, a foster home provider told me that my child was not their problem and that I made my bed. My story is not uncommon. There are other teen parents in foster care struggling with similar challenges in addition to this pandemic. COVID-19 has impacted us all as a nation. During this time, we see families come together to support one another. Unfortunately, for pregnant and parenting foster youth, they are struggling with challenges and are in desperate need of support. Almost half of teen girls that enter foster care will have a child by age 19. Of those, many of them will unfortunately see their own child removed and placed in foster care. Congress has recognized the unique needs of pregnant and parenting youth in foster care through the Family First Prevention Services Act, which does allow states to provide prevention services. While this is significant, so much more needs to be done to support pregnant and parenting foster youth through this pandemic and to prevent their children from entering foster care, thus interrupting the intergenerational cycle. First, I urge Congress to provide funding through Chafee or Title IV-B to provide the basic needs of pregnant and parenting foster youth, such as baby items, childcare, and parenting support services, including home visiting programs and access to nurse practitioners. Lastly, I urge the Department of Health and Human Services to issue guidance to states on how they can meet the needs of expected and parenting foster youth. Thank you. Hello, and my name is Chanel Lavalle, and I am from the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation in Montana. My tribes are Ani and Nakoda, and I'm currently pursuing my bachelor's in elementary education at Salish Kootenai College. So the COVID-19 pandemic is creating a disconnection for people across the country and their families and communities. This fact is the life for many tribal youth with or without the pandemic. I was disconnected from my tribal community at the age of one and placed into the foster care system. I was fortunate enough to have a foster mom who nurtured my growth as a person and academically. When I was 15, my foster mom passed away very unexpectedly and her passing exposed the truth and dysfunction of my foster care experience. I was enduring abuse that started at the age of one and lasted until my late teens. This unaddressed trauma created many obstacles throughout my college career. I tried leaving college many times before finding the Division of Education at Salish Kootenai College, and they encouraged me to live a better life despite my hardship. They also helped me find the financial support and resources needed to be successful in higher education. These educators went above and beyond for my success. Several tribal youth are removed from their communities and placed into the foster care system. In fact, Native American children are 4.3 times more likely than white children to be removed. Tribal youth with a background in foster care tend to stray away from educational settings due to the lack of support in meeting their unique needs. The Higher Education Amendment establishes the American Indian Tribally Controlled Colleges and Universities TCCU program, which provides grants to TCCUs to improve and expand their capacity to serve American Indian students. These programs are an important step forward, but the United States still needs to live up to its promises to support and invest in tribal youth especially the young people the government has removed from their families and communities and placed into foster care. This cycle began in the early 19th century when Native American children were forced to attend residential schools that assimilated them and stripped them from their culture. 
Congress should amend the Higher Education Act to provide funding to allow TCCUs to establish a program to serve tribal students who have experienced foster care. Education is said to be the great equalizer. In this case, we need to promise tribal youth that they will receive a level playing field and achieving success in higher education. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cortez Carey. I would first like to thank the staff at CCAI for an amazing and challenging experience this summer and my awesome policy advisor, Jay Murphy, for his mentorship through it all. Let's talk about change. I spent 21 years in the foster care system without my biological mother, father, or siblings. I bounced around from foster homes to group homes, shelters, detention centers, to relatives and kinship care, and even had a failed adoption. Permanency had no place in my life. For many years, school was my safe haven and the only stable, reliable thing in my life. I would stay after for extracurricular activities, help people with their homework, and best of all, no one knew what my home life was like. That all changed when I started high school. In ninth grade, I moved four times and attended three different schools within six months. Studies show that just one move during the school year can set a child behind, but I didn't need a study to show that. By senior year, I had attended six high schools and didn't know what was next. Less than 50% of foster youth graduate high school, less than 3% go on to higher education, and less than 1% graduate from college. Fast forwarding to 2020, I have two associate's degrees, one bachelor's, and am a rising second year student in the Master of Social Work program at Howard University. I had resources to help me get where I am today. However, students today don't have that same access. COVID-19 forced schools to move exclusively to online learning, which left many foster youth suddenly without access to education because they did not have the appropriate technology or internet connectivity to participate. Congress should authorize a new grant program under the Higher Education Opportunity Act to provide all foster children with computers, Wi-Fi access, internet hotspots, online tutors, and other necessary technology supports to ensure foster youth have equitable virtual learning opportunities. Their lives depend on it. What else can Congress do? Six steps. One, commit. You are legally responsible. Two, hire. Tutors should be available for virtual instructional help. Three, accommodate. Establish a new grant program available to any agency school or university that pays for a range of technology supports based on each young person's unique needs. Four, navigate. Utilize the TRIO programs, which are designed to assist underprivileged and disadvantaged youth. Five, gather. A simple research on how foster youth education is affected by this pandemic. And finally, six, execute. I urge Congress to implement my suggestions as a long-term solution to ensure that youth in foster care have the full range of technology they need and deserve. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Melvin Roy, and I'm a Richmond, Virginia native that is currently studying at Old Dominion University. Before I tell you all about my recommendation, I would like to first thank CCAI for this opportunity and extend a huge thanks to my policy advisor, Ms. Tiffany Allen, for guiding me through this process. In the beginning of March, life was normal for many of us until the COVID-19 pandemic upended everything. I found myself going from one day casually enjoying my spring break to the next day panicking and struggling to figure out how I was gonna transition from college back to my grandmother's house in the middle of the semester. In the midst of trying to figure out how I was going to make that sudden transition, I found myself running short of financial support. My campus job had been put on hold, which forced me to reach into my emergency savings, which was not much in order to cover moving expenses and immediate needs that came up. My experience as well as the, experience, as well as the experiences of other young adults in foster care created a huge need for more financial support, which unfortunately was not available to an overwhelming majority of us in a serious time of need. Thankfully, I was fortunate to have the support of my grandparents during this hard time, but there were many other foster youth who did not have the support that I did. In a survey conducted by Foster Club, it was found that 65, excuse me, percent of young adults in foster care were laid off from work 
and that 52% did not receive a stimulus check from the federal government. Although we do have programs for young adults in foster care, such as the John H. Chafee Foster Care Program, which extends supports for young adults in foster care, that is not enough. So first, ask Congress to establish the HOPE Fund, which will be a new government trust fund that will require all states with extended foster care to create HOPE Fund accounts for every eligible young adult aged 18 to 21. Each youth will have $1,000 a month deposited into their account with 50% of the funds contributed by the federal government and 50% of the funds as a state contribution. This would enable every eligible young adult in foster care to use up to $500 of the trust fund per month while in care and receive the remaining value tax-free to provide a financial cushion when they age out of care at the age of 21. I urge members of Congress to support this recommendation that will give young adults in foster care hope for the present and hope for their future. Thank you. Hello, thank you for joining us today. A special thanks to CCAI and their partners for all their work, especially to my policy advisor, Stephanie Sproul. My name is Autumn Adams. I'm an enrolled member of the Yakima Nation and I currently reside in Washington State. My story came full circle. My maternal grandmother was my caregiver when I was young and now I provide the same safety and stability to my siblings. My sister is a spitfire. She's as stubborn and determined as they come, but her smile could light up any room. My brother is quick-witted and humble, but the moment he sees any animal, his face fills with joy. I gained custody of my siblings five years ago. While attending college, I had no financial security. I worked multiple jobs and I did different internships in order to save money and pay for necessities throughout the school year. I had just started my journey to financial security post-graduation when the pandemic started. We faced new challenges, the closure of public schools, moving, increased budget constraints and financial hardships due to COVID. This became even more apparent when my household grew in June. I was reminded of the lack of available resources to informal kinship caregivers and how important it is to have a place where I could turn to for help. Luckily, these places do exist. They're called kinship navigator programs, which are programs designed to provide information and assistance to kinship caregivers like myself. Under the Family First Prevention Services Act, federal funds are now available for navigators that meet certain evidence-based standards. However, these standards are not conducive for evaluating the effectiveness of navigators, which has resulted in no program qualifying for federal reimbursement. The Children's Bureau should create a pilot program to test different types of evidence-based standards that may be more appropriate to evaluate the effectiveness of navigators. While doing my research, I also found out that navigators have the option to only serve kinship families formally involved in the child welfare system. This option is problematic because more children are raised by a kin outside of the formal child welfare system. These families need more support because they don't have access to the type of services that families within the system do. Congress needs to require that kinship navigator programs receiving federal funding under Family First are serving informal caregivers. Both of these recommendations are needed now during this COVID crisis as more relatives are struggling to support the children in their care and more navigators are needed to connect these families to additional support and resources. When all is said and done, the most important thing is ensuring families remain together. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining my colleagues and I for today's briefing. My name is Haley D'Elia and I'm a rising senior at Rowan University pursuing a bachelor's in mathematics and sociology with a certificate in social justice and social change. During the summer of my sophomore year of high school, I was isolated in my biological mother's abusive home. I didn't have a phone, computer, or internet in the home, so I relied on the public library in my neighborhood to do my schoolwork and connect with vital supports. My mother also prohibited me from seeing or speaking to any of my extended family and my therapist. And since it was summer, I was not able to confide in my teachers and school counselors. Not being virtually connected put me in increasingly dangerous situations when abuse and neglect occurred in the home. I still remember times when I would have to run to my neighbor's home to call for help because I didn't have a phone to do so. 
Similar to my situation, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused social isolation for children and families due to shelter in orders and social distancing measures. Children are no longer seeing their teachers, coaches, doctors, and therapists, and extended family who would normally be there to offer support. Technology has become our lifeline, connecting us to the outside world during this time. For children and families that do not have digital access, the pandemic has caused extreme isolation, which combined with financial stress, unemployment, and uncertainty is likely to lead to an increase in child abuse and neglect. For children and families already involved in the child welfare system, a lack of digital access means they are cut off from virtual support services. To help close the digital divide and keep children safe, Congress should first allow Title IV-B funds to be used to provide internet and other technology to vulnerable youth and families involved in the child welfare system. And second, Congress should also authorize a monthly reimbursement to low-income families up to $100 to support the purchase of broadband and other devices such as a phone, laptop, or tablet. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Isabel Goodrich. I am from the state of Maine. I currently live in Colorado where I'm studying history and political science at Western Colorado University. During my time in foster care, I was raised by my grandparents. My grandfather suffers from ongoing health issues that made my time in his home difficult. If COVID-19 emerged during my time in my grandparents' care, they would have faced even greater difficulties in ensuring that our needs were met. Having a source of funding to help them with supports they could not get elsewhere would have been an enormous help by taking a financial weight off their shoulders, especially when they're already facing stressful health problems. Foster care funds, Medicaid, SNAP, and the Family Caregiver Support Program are important existing sources of funding to help families pay with, for, a, for a variety of basic needs, but they do not always pay for important services such as transportation, technology for distance learning, grocery delivery, and other supplies. Clarifying that Kinship Navigator funds can be used for direct services and supplies would allow family members to better understand the type of help that is available to provide for their children. Federal law defines Kinship Navigator programs as services that assist kinship caregivers in learning about and accessing programs and resources to meet the needs of the children they are raising. Despite this broad statutory language, however, many states believe that kinship navigator programs are only intended to improve the caregiver's knowledge of services and assist them in being able to identify and access the services they need and not to cover the cost of the services themselves. Given this common misinterpretation, more precise language on how kinship navigator funding can be used is needed to ensure that all states understand that they can use these four E dollars to pay for direct goods and services and other immediate needs presented by COVID-19. Congress should amend Title IV-E of the Social Security Act to make it clear that states can use federally allocated funding under the Kinship Navigator Program to purchase critical goods and supplies to help caregivers meet basic needs and maintain family stability during the COVID-19 pandemic and in other times of crises. Thank you so much. My name is Alan Abuti. I spent two years in foster care before I was adopted at five. My biological parents were incapable of caring for me because of their struggles with substance abuse. In my foster home, I was the third youngest of seven children and the smallest. The older kids got away with tormenting the younger kids, locking us downstairs to watch horror movies, throwing us in the dryer, and even locking the bathroom door so we'd soil ourselves and be punished. Like many adoptees who've experienced foster care, I carried the trauma from my foster home to my adoptive home. My trauma made it hard for me to connect with my new family. I was angry and had trust issues, but due to their patience and love, they helped me seek counseling. It made all the difference in me being able to thrive. COVID-19 has moved everything online, including counseling. I am blessed to have the financial and technology resources to continue counseling during COVID. But 
Not every foster and adoptive family can say the same. Only 81% of American households have access to the internet. This means one in five families are left without the help they need. The pandemic has left many foster and adoptive youth who struggle like me, stranded and without counseling because they cannot afford internet access or technology like cell phones or camera enabled laptops to accommodate virtual counseling. This prevents foster and adopted youth from building the loving relationships they deserve. They can't make progress towards navigating their trauma. This pandemic is inhibiting foster youth from thriving. COVID-19 has exposed existing problems within our society, and it's clear the internet can no longer be considered a luxury item, but an absolute necessity for all Americans, especially foster and adoptive families who need support now more than ever. Congress should permanently allow low-income foster families to benefit from the Title IV-E resources through a 75% reimbursement for basic technology goods to allow for equitable access to counseling. Currently, these Title IV-E resources are only accessible when invoked by the Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Resistance Act. But the Stafford Act only covers natural disasters, which are few and far between. This is a problem because foster families face crisis routinely. It is time that Congress recognize foster families need more regular and consistent help. Foster kids can't log out of trauma, so Congress needs to log in and keep them connected to the services and supports they need and deserve. Thank you. The lives of foster youth should never be used as a trial and error experiment to promote the growth of those entrusted with ensuring their safety. With each negative experience in foster care, youth carry additional trauma that increases their barriers to success in the future. Fortunately, this has the potential to be avoided. My name is Michaela James, and I spent nine years in the California child welfare system. I am a sister, daughter, friend, advocate, and social worker. With a case file dating back to 1999, interactions with social workers was a part of every stage of my development. Now more than ever, it is vital that we invest in our child welfare workforce to ensure they receive the training and support needed to uplift vulnerable families and build resilience in the workforce. A combination of my lived experience and passion to create a better system for the youth coming behind me led me to pursue a bachelor's degree in social work. At the time, I strongly believed that my lived experience alongside a social welfare curriculum would be what I would need to truly make a difference as a direct service provider. To my surprise, upon graduation, I was overwhelmed with my lack of confidence in my ability to work with one of the country's most vulnerable populations, foster youth. When I voiced these concerns, I was told that I would learn the necessary skills to be successful once I received a caseload. This narrative is one of the many reasons that child welfare professionals report a higher burnout rate than any other helping profession in the country. When you combine this culture with a global pandemic, it becomes critical to take immediate action. Research has shown that child welfare agencies across the United States have seen an increased rate of child abuse and neglect following natural and economic disasters. As COVID-19 continues to impact employment rates, housing stability, and access to services, Experts believe that the child welfare system should begin preparing for a significant caseload increase. It is essential that we increase funding streams that prioritize training and release national guidance that is responsive to the need for workforce training and support. The administration and Congress can take immediate action to support the child welfare workers who have been and continue to be working on the front lines of this pandemic. The Children's Bureau should disseminate guidance to state child welfare agencies regarding building resilience in their workforce during the public health emergency. I urge Congress to direct federal child welfare dollars to support caseworkers by increasing Title IV-B and Title IV-E of the Social Security Act to promote social worker retention and training during the COVID-19 crisis. I would like to thank the administration, Congress, and CCAI for creating a space that not only elevates the youth voice, but creates a platform for those with lived experience to be at the forefront of the fight to reform the child welfare system. I urge each and every one of you to ensure that we invest in the child welfare workforce so they can continue to invest in our children. As Nelson Mandela once said, 
there was, can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Layla Rose Hudson, and I attend law school at The Ohio State University. I spent a lot of time this summer reflecting on what a quarantine would have meant for me during my time in foster care, or even when I lived with my biological family. Unfortunately, the picture it paints isn't pretty. I've been in foster homes where the watchful eye of a social worker was the only thing that stood in between myself and going hungry. See, my foster parents had to be reminded that at 16, maybe I shouldn't be responsible for providing for all of my own needs with money for my after-school job. I still went hungry some nights. Since the pandemic began, Congress has scrambled to pass relief acts. The Children's Bureau has handed down new guidelines to child welfare agencies allowing for virtual visitations. However, Social workers have not had the time, nor is there funding for training on this new platform. Notably, in 2018, 21% of child mistreatment was reported by educators. With youth all over the country out of school, abuse is more likely to go undetected. Children may lack the privacy to speak with mandated reporters, with potential abusers being just off screen. Furthermore, Many families are without the technological resources necessary to participate in these visits. I've been in homes that were abusive in a variety of ways. The thought of having to shelter in place with them with perhaps no viable or safe way for a social worker or even a teacher to ensure my well-being makes me fear for today's youth. I ask Congress today to imagine a scenario in which in-person visits are impossible. What happens to the families and child welfare agencies that do not have the technology, social workers who have not received adequate trauma-informed training, and most importantly, the children left in high-risk situations who rely on social workers to keep them safe? That is why I am asking Congress to increase funding to CAPTA, a program designed to prevent child mistreatment. This will grant the child welfare workforce the tools necessary to create and implement disaster preparedness plans that place appropriate limits on the use of virtual platforms so as to prioritize child safety. Congress should ensure the child welfare workforce is prepared for any situation so that there are fewer children and youth with a story like mine. Thank you. Hello, hello again. My name is Ian Marks, and I'm currently a rising senior at the University of Notre Dame, majoring in political science, and I currently live in Louisiana. Though I have a bright future ahead of me, it didn't feel like that a few years ago. Back when I was only 11 years old, I had lost my mother, my father, and was effectively the last surviving member of my family. With no one to care for me at the time, I was placed into foster care. And at the beginning, there were days where I was crying alone in a closet crying to God, asking for my mother and father back, and others where I had stopped eating for days at a time. Coupled with my own physical and mental health problems, I was terrified and afraid for my future ahead. However, the caseworker assigned to me was one of the people that helped me the most during the worst times in my life. They took me to therapy to help me deal with my personal trauma. They took me to doctor appointments to get me the help I needed and did in-person visitations to ensure the home I was in was okay. Not only did my caseworker help me receive the necessary support to transition into foster care, but also made me feel like I had a true friend during a time where I had lost everyone. I'm not alone, as many other foster youth and families depend on receiving services from not only their caseworkers, but teachers and doctors as well. However, since the pandemic has effectively closed down these other institutions, foster youth are even more reliant on their caseworkers for support and stability than ever before. While the flexibility to conduct virtual meetings has helped caseworkers maintain some connections, youth without technology access cannot maintain these connections. A survey of foster youth in Washington from the Treehouse Foundation noted that 49% of children lacked the necessary resources during the pandemic, including laptops and cell phones. If I were a foster child today, I don't know if I would even have the tools needed to reach my caseworker. Caseworkers need to operate their full capacity to assist children and families, but that's just not possible with the current limit 
on technology. A potential solution to this can be seen through increasing Title IV-B funding. Title IV-B includes funding to support the purchase of technology, including cell phones, laptops, tablets, and broadband technological access needed during COVID-19. Though Congress has allocated funding to Title IV-B through the CARES Act, states would still benefit significantly from specific funding to technology to ensure that foster youth get the support they need from their caseworkers. Congress should increase funding to Title IV-B and direct some of that funding to support the purchase of technology. And I thank you all again for your time. Once again, my name is Haley Delia. I would like to thank members of Congress, their staff, the child welfare community, as well as our loved ones, friends, and colleagues for attending our briefing today. I would also like to thank the CCAI staff, our policy report advisors, and Rebecca and Mary from Child Focus for their dedication and guidance this summer. One of the many questions that has guided, that has guided each member of this cohort this summer was, how would or how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted our personal journey through the child welfare system? This question was intricate for each of us in our own ways as we learned to unpack our past and integrate our stories with the complexities of a pandemic. As challenging as this was for us, we knew that it would lead to meaningful solutions. Each of my colleagues and I are here today to improve the system so that the children behind us do not have to face the same difficulties that we have. Unfortunately, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, the odds stacked against foster youth have only become more daunting. The disparities that COVID-19 has shed a light on are not new. They have just been amplified. In these uncertain times, those involved in the child welfare system need support now more than ever. And you have the power to give vulnerable children and families the assistance they need. Our vigilance in these matters is not optional, but necessary if we as a system want to properly serve the children, youth, and families in the child welfare system. Thank you for your time and your commitment in seeking profound change. I would like to introduce CCAI's Director of Policy, Taylor Drady, to facilitate our Q&A session. Good afternoon. My name is Taylor Drady, and I'm the Director of Policy at CCAI, and we'd like to thank you for joining today's briefing. I had the honor and privilege, along with the rest of the CCAI team, to work with these extraordinary individuals this summer. We will now open it up for a question and answer period. We'd like to ask if you have a question for one of the FOSS youth interns, or some of them, to use the hand raise feature on Zoom, and we will call on you. Once called on, please state your name, and where you're calling from. Before we turn it over to questions, I'd like to turn it over to our executive director, Nancy Blackwell. Thank you, Taylor. I just wanted to jump in and say thank you to our foster youth interns for their excellent presentations today. I hope that everyone enjoyed it. Here in the Washington DC area, we are experiencing a significant summer storm. Um, and I just wanted to let you all know that we may experience a couple technical difficulties because of the storm. If you all could be patient with us as we try to get through this question and answer period. Thank you. Back to you, Taylor. Great. Thanks so much, Nancy. All right. We have a few questions coming in. We also um, have the chat feature open as well. If you have any questions you'd like to put in the chat, feel free to do so. But the first question um, I'd like to call on is Marcia Hopkins. Do you wanna go ahead and ask your question, Marcia? Okay. Marcia, if you could unmute yourself, that would be helpful. Okay, we'll come back to you. I'm, I'm oh, there so you are. sorry. <laughs> no problem. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I wanted to see if someone asked um, Michaela, I think, um, or honestly, this question I think could be for a lot of people on the call, but just. Um, 
sorry, I kind of want to introduce myself too. So I also did the FYI program. So I'm really excited to um, have been a part of this today with you all. Um, and so I work with young people and often what comes up, I think in conversations is, um, what are the specific needs of young people um, in the child welfare system? And are there things that you feel like um, you didn't get from either a caseworker or your attorney um, in relation to, you know, the, the reports that you all are doing in your own experiences? Um, I feel like that often comes up and I feel challenged trying to teach or educate attorneys and caseworkers on what are from a young person's perspective, like what are the things that they felt like they did not get or receive and they wanted more from them. Thank you for that question. Um, so in my professional career, I have chosen to really focus on positive youth engagement. And so I know that really a common term that is used right now is the trauma informed care, trauma informed methods of communicating with youth. And I really encourage service providers to look into a healing centered engagement method that is really going to start shifting the mindset and the narrative from victim oriented communication to young people to survivor oriented communication for young people and i believe that will have a thank you thanks so much michaela um i'd now like to um ask megan thompson um do you have a question for an fyi or for the group I do. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Um, so my name is Megan. I'm a senior policy advisor with Senator Rosen. And um, thank you for being so flexible and doing this virtually this year. I always look forward to this briefing. Um, one statistic stood out, and I want to make sure both that I heard it correctly and also ask um, what the specific challenges behind it were, but that about half of fo foster youth did not receive their stimulus check in one of the recent COVID relief packages. So if anyone can speak to reasons why they did not receive their check, um, maybe that's something we can look into. Sure, that's a really great question, Megan. Do any of the FOSS youth interns, if you would like to raise your hand to answer Megan's question? If not, Megan, we can circle back. Okay, Melvin, do you want to answer Megan's question? Okay, hi, Megan. Um, so while I was doing my research, um, I, uh, okay, so I'm gonna speak for personal experience first. I did not receive a stimulus check because I, even though I, uh, it's kind of interesting how it worked. I believe that I was claimed on someone's taxes, but I don't know whose taxes I was claimed on. And so I feel like that is one reason why a lot of foster youth did not receive stimulus checks is because um, they were being claimed on someone's taxes. Um, and yeah, it, it is a very high percentage and it's, it's, um, it's one that brings about a lot of questions. Um, but yeah, so. Great, thanks so much, Melvin. All right, um, John Paul Horn, I see you have a question. Would you like to ask it? Sure. Hi, everybody. Hello, FYIs. Uh, I read the report this morning because I told you I read the report every year. Um, I'm Dr. John Paul Horn. I'm an assistant professor of, Cal of social work at Cal State University East Bay, also an FYI alum from 2009. Um, but I do a lot of research in foster care, um, particularly around young people aging out of foster care. Um, I'm really excited that you guys brought up technology as uh, something that really needs to be addressed because we see it as not just a need for foster youth, but a lot of vulnerable families across the country. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit, um, anybody who's uh, on the panel, if you can talk a little bit about how you can see technology and this other big recommendation that you made in the report about connection working together. So how can we support that? At, uh, as people who advocate and are interested in making that kind of change happen. Awesome. Thanks so much for your question, JP. Um, do any of the FYIs want to raise their hand in the chat? 
I know we had several um, technology focused reports this year. Haley, would you like to answer? Um, yeah, um, to kind of get out your question, um, my report was specifically focused on vulnerable youth and families, like, and I use my personal experience um, before I entered foster care. Um, but basically, I don't think people realize how vital um, being connected is, like virtually connected is, um, not just for school, but to even be connected to friends and loved ones um, that you can talk to and engage with during like these very difficult times. Like I was isolated in my mom's home um, when I was 16, but at that point I still had the public library, you know? Um, and although like that was limited at times, like it's nothing compared to what children are facing right now. Um, so I hope that helps. Awesome. Thanks, Haley. Alan, do you want to go ahead and answer? Yeah, um, I'd love to answer that question. Um, I've been blessed to have a family that provides resources like, you know, a laptop, um, cell phone. So I was able to contact my counselor that was provided by my campus um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. But I have friends um, who have dealt with trauma, others who can't afford these resources. So it's hard for them to um, contact counselors or contact biological parents. Um, and this is important for foster kids because we deal with a lot of trauma, um, gone through a lot of stuff in the past and without being able to you know, talk to a counselor, talk to our, our biological parents or get in contact, it really takes an emotional, mental toll and can really, you know, put a hole in some of our relationships. So I think it's it's definitely a key thing for uh, Congress to look, look at going forward is to really um, incorporate technology and connection and the emotional support it has. Great, thanks, Alan. Um, Ian, do you want to go ahead and answer as well? Yeah, of course. Um, so that's a really good question because it really, we wonder how connections are affected with technology. And that's an important thing to recognize. And Alan highlighted something really important. There's a very high need for the connection to receive resources. But how do you receive those resources? In my personal experience, it was through my caseworker. But the only way I could really communicate with my caseworker and my personal experience was when they had that face-to-face -face interaction, in-person visitations. But we don't live in that environment right now. Things have significantly changed. I personally didn't even receive a cell phone. I don't think for years later. I don't think that, I mean, I don't think I received a cell phone for over five years when I was placed in foster care when I was only 11. And that is something really to recognize, is it not only inhibits the ability for people to receive services, it in, without technology, you don't have the capacity to even get those resources or even request them because you would need a caseworker for a lot of those situations. So there are multiple areas, but in my um, explanation, caseworkers, it really helps facilitate a better connection between caseworkers and youth when that um, interaction is definitely necessary. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, I see that we have a question in the chat from Sharon Valenti. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? I know you have your hand raised as well. Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I am an adoptive mother. Uh, my boys were adopted from Russia uh, when we were living in Ohio. My compliments to the congressional representation that helped us slice through the paperwork. Um, that's a whole nother discussion. Um, I want to compliment all the presenters. You just, I was awed, both personally as an adoptive mother, professionally as a senior administrator in higher education. However, what I would like to say is you made some excellent calls backed by research of actions that need to be taken. What can we do as a community to further those, those actions you called for? That's a really great question, Sharon. Um, Michaela, would you like to answer that? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think right now, the average American has a really unique insight on the day-to-day -day lives of foster youth. 
So because of the COVID-19 pandemic, today we all have limited to no access to our family members. Today we all patiently wait for guidance to be released that allows us access to normal activities. And today we all worry about our housing and income stability, but every day for decades, these have been the worries that have been in the forefront of foster youth minds. So my hope is that when we move beyond this pandemic, that we really don't forget that. And we begin to, as community members, legislators and advocates continue to uplift these struggles so that we can create a better system for future foster youth. Great, thanks so much, Michaela. Layla Rose. Do you want to answer as well? Sure. Um, so I think that it's important for the community to care. Um, and I think that starts with the individual advocating. We, a lot of us, we know what the issues are, especially if we've ever been involved in the adoptive system or the foster care system. We, we know what the issues are. Um, we need to advocate. We need to raise awareness so that other members in the community who um, some of these st statistics may be shocking to them, like only 50% of foster kids graduating high school. Um, in addition, if you, know, if you can't foster, donate. Uh, donate to organizations that are supporting foster youth in our community. Um, if you can't donate, just raise awareness. Do everything you can to let people know that we face youth like myself have faced a lot of barriers that are completely undeserved and we deserve a level uh, playing field just like everyone else. Great. Thanks so much, Layla Rose. Cortez? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, in my report, uh, my number one recommendation was for Congress to commit uh, you're legally responsible, and if you look at us as, or look at former or current foster youth as your own children, you will want the best for them. Um, so opening up more platforms, um, like Layla Rose said, for foster youth to be able to advocate for themselves, because as being a, a person who has walked those um, those roles and been in those shoes, like I know what I, I know what is best for me. I know what didn't work for me, and I know what may could have worked for me so allowing foster youth more platforms like the uh, foster club all-star internship uh, the ccai foster youth internship um uh, and allowing youth to have a voice great thanks so much cortez we're going to take another question from the hand raise patterson if you're still on, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Patterson. Um, I'm a, a former child welfare advocate in California. I'm going to be moving soon, so that's why. But my question is, and it looks like it's for Michaela. She's been answering a lot. Um, so in regards to her proposal, have you or any other child welfare advocates, either locally or in any state, noticed any trends or trainings? that have been successful in supporting foster youth in this time? Because in your recommendation, you talked about increasing funding and national guidance. So I'm just curious if, if y'all have noticed any of that already in terms of different states or efforts that are going on. Thanks, Patterson. Um, yeah, I would actually, so I have in my report, I outlined three different training topics that I think would be really influential to release at this time. And I also want to highlight that I did a lot of these topics from the youth training project that is operating out of California Youth Connection. So I do want to give them a shout out. Um, and the three topics that I really narrowed in on are focusing on building resilience in the workforce for social workers, um, really understanding the needs of vulnerable youth and families, especially specific to these times during COVID-19. And then again, um, just engaging with youth in a healing centered engagement method for positive youth development. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you both. We have another question in the chat. Um, Lupe asked, and this is for all of you. Isabel? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And I think generally speaking, just a little acts of kindness, compassion, and empathy go a long way. Um, and so I've definitely found that in this 
uh, climate with COVID, um, just like those little acts of kindness um, from strangers or um, with community members, that's really helped my spirits be up. Um, and I know that's very general, but I would just say like those little acts of kindness and compassion um, have been very, very helpful for me. Great. Thank you, Isabel. Tashe? I would say just being able to connect with other alumni during this time and seeing everybody work together to make sure that youth who are experiencing foster care or have experienced foster care are taken care of. Like I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, it was a small organization that rallied together to get laptops for um, other foster youth. So just seeing the, um, just everybody come together and help each other has been um, a great, great thing. Great. Thanks, Tasha. Melvin, do you want to answer last and then we'll go to the next question? Yes. So, um, Lupe, thanks for that question. Um, I don't have to say personally, um, the, the one thing that's kind of kept hope alive during this pandemic is this internship. Um, this internship has definitely, definitely changed my life in <laughs> so many ways. And even though I had to sit at home and do it, um, it definitely kept hope alive for me. So I'm very grateful for this internship and this experience. Great. Thanks, Melvin. Okay, we'll take another question from the attendees. Tony, would you like to go ahead and um, announce yourself, say where you're from, and ask your question? Sure. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Hi, everyone. My name's Tony Parsons. I am also an alumni of the FYI program, class of 2014. I had the pleasure of actually serving as a policy advisor this year with Alan. Um, but my question is actually for Junelli. Um, you brought up pregnant and parenting foster youth, which I think is a very unique population um, within the foster care system. Uh, and I read the report. So I guess my question is it's two pronged. Um, are you asking, do you think it should be just more Chafee dollars or a specific set aside Chafee dollars for pregnant parenting? That's the first question. And then second question, were there programs that were like that you found to be helpful that you know might want to be replicated on like just a larger scale? Thank you for your question. Um, I believe that there should be funding set aside dedicated to pregnant and parenting youth um, throughout the time that they are in foster care. And uh, to answer your second question, there are um, some programs in different states in place that support pregnant and parenting foster youth a model that uh, Public Council and Alliance for Children's Rights do here in um, California. It's called uh, EPY, Expected Parenting Youth um, Team Conferences, where they assign a resource specialist um, to the youth that is very knowledgeable in um, working with teen parents in foster care. And really, they put them in the kind of like in the driver's seat of their life on how they want to support them um, with life goals and um, helping their children um, by educating the parent on uh, parenting support services and connecting them to any type of resource any parent may need, like legal aid, mental health services, um, child care, and so forth. And I believe that um, there's just so much more we need to do across the nation to support pregnant and parenting youth. Um, and just in comparison to other states, I believe California is just one of the ones that are kind of steering um, the direction. But again, there's just so much more we need to do. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Janelli. Um, gonna go back to the chat here. Um, we're only gonna take another question or two. And if you have additional questions for the FOSSI Youth Intern or for the group as a whole, you can reach out to CCAI and we will put you directly in contact um, with them and we'll write the email in the chat, but you can reach out to info, I-N-F-O, at ccainstitute.org. All right, we will take another question. And I think this one is from Kristen Glickman at Youth Villages. And it's a question for all the FOSS youth interns. But Kristen would like to know um, if you could share what's next for each of you in the fall and what's your plans academically, professionally, service, um, or anything like that. So um, Layla Rose, do you want to kick it off? Um, sure, absolutely. 
So my plans in the fall are to start my second year of law school, which I've been told is the hardest. So here's to that. Um, and I, but I'm very excited. Um, I'm actually taking another internship with um, the Children's Service Transformation Office, which is an office created by the governor of Ohio specifically for the purpose of um, improving the foster system. So I'm super excited about that. And then next summer, hopefully, fingers crossed, I will be in DC with CCAI. Great. Janelle? Um, what I'll be doing in the near future is I'll be returning back to my work um, with the community college. I work for a foster youth program and assisting foster youth in um, getting their degrees. And I hope to start on um, my private foundation that I've been desperately wanting to um, start for some time now. And in the near future, I want to return um, uh, to school for my master's degree in higher education. Great. Thanks, Janelle. Cortez? Yeah, so uh, in the fall, I am going back to Howard virtually mm -hmm. to complete my uh, MSW program. Mm -hmm. And uh, next summer, I will be back with CCAI. And in the near future, I plan to become a licensed clinical social worker. Um, two options, maybe uh, at the VA um, or in the United States. Air Force. That's just for me for right now. Awesome. Thanks, Cortez. Chanel? Hi. So, um, so I plan on completing my final year at SKC next fall. Um, and then just like Layla Rose and Cortez and the rest of us, hopefully I'll be back in DC next year with CCAI. Um, I do plan on pursuing my master's in educational leadership uh, to gain, first I want to gain teaching experience and then uh, hopefully serve as a superintendent for Great Falls Public Schools in Montana. Great. Thanks, Chanel. Tasha? This fall I'll be heading back to Ohio State to start my second year of my MSW program. I'll be interning for the Columbus City Attorney's Office while working with um, NIDA in the near future. I hope to be back in um, DC this, this summer working with CCAI, but after I graduate, I hope to be a staffer working on policies from a social work lens. Great, thanks Tasha. Tasha. Autumn? Hi, um, <clears throat> this fall I will be working on another policy recommendation for Congressman Mullen's office focusing on a family first tribal model to um, look at their evidence-based standards as well. Um, I will also be applying for graduate school. Um, I plan on hopefully attending a concurrent law school slash master's in public policy focused program. Um, I will also, um, if that doesn't work out, apply for a PhD program at the University of Oregon focused on indigenous and race and ethnicity. So it's exciting and we'll be raising children and dealing with more virtual public school learning. Awesome, thanks Autumn. Haley? Um, yeah, so um, this fall I plan on um, applying to a Fulbright um, to teach English and English in another country um, for the next academic year, um, finishing up my undergrad degrees, um, and hopefully applying to law school afterwards. Um, but we will see what happens. Great. Thanks, Haley. Isabel? Hello. Um, yeah, so I plan on going back to Colorado in the fall to finish my last year on campus um, and to get prepared for my student teaching uh, the upcoming academic school year. Um, yeah, and then I will be back in D.C. working for CCAI in the summer. Hopefully, fingers crossed that everything is better by then, um, and I hope to teach U.S. history um, to high, to high schoolers. Great. Thanks, Isabel. Melvin? Hi, 
so uh, for me, I will be uh, going into my junior year at Old Dominion University. Um, and I'm young, so I don't know. <laughs> it's just so much, I have so much time. Um, <laughs> but moving forward, I, I guess what I have to look forward to is interning with CCI next summer um, and starting my senior year and then applying to grad school, whether and I, either George Washington or American University. Um, those are my top two. And uh, hopefully long, long term working on the Hill. So yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Melvin. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. I put the email in the chat box if you want to reach out to any of um, the FYIs to ask them more questions or dive deeper into their report. I'm sure they'd love to connect with you further. Um, I would like to pass it over again to our Executive Durant Director, Nancy K. Blackwell. Thank you, Taylor, and I hope everyone enjoyed all of the presentations today. Uh, before we have our closing from our esteemed board chair, I just wanted to take a second and again say thank you to all of our sponsors, the Dave Thomas Foundation, the Carlson Family Foundation, ACLI, Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, Shrek, Retail Orphans Initiative, Integrated Legislative Strategies, Bella Grazia Fund, Rita Lewis, Paul and Emily Singer Foundation, and the Walter Johnson Foundation. Um, I will now pass it over to our um, board chairwoman, the Honorable Senator Mary Landrieu. Good afternoon, everyone. This has been a remarkable, remarkable program. And it's been such a blessing for me as one of the founders of CCAI many, many years ago to be able to observe and be part of this briefing, I think almost every year for the last 20. And I don't know how this happens, but they get better and better and better every year. So Ian and all of the group from this year, your presentations were just spectacular. They were thoughtful, they were specific, um, they had research to back them up. And I can promise you that the members that are listening, over 350 people um, registered for our opportunity this afternoon. And many of those that registered are staff members of members of, the, of Congress, of the House and the Senate. And I can promise you those staffers, if the past is any indication of the future, have been taking you know, uh, notes throughout this whole entire hour and a half and come up and received from you all so many wonderful ideas for legislation, for policy changes. And that's really one of the most powerful elements of this program, and I can't thank our sponsors enough. Without you, this program would not be possible. And each one of these young people has received a very generous stipend this summer, even with COVID, even with all of the challenges. They've been able to receive a stipend, be engaged, be positive, be hopeful, and be helpful to what we're trying to do to build a better, uh, a much better child welfare system in this country for all children. And so we really, really appreciate, I just can't tell you how much we appreciate the support of our sponsors that make this possible. Young, um, the young adults that are part of the CCI program because of the COVID summer, we're excited to have them back, um, as many of them that can come back next year and actually have a, a more normal internship where they can actually spend some time on the Hill and in the offices. Um, so they will have almost like a double program and we, you know, we just really look forward to seeing you all next summer and we'll do everything we can to support you throughout the year uh, in this virtual way and then see you on the ground here next summer. Um, to everyone listening in, I hope that you've taken notes as well, and to all your many organizations and strategic partners that we work with, not only throughout our country, but all around the world. Some of you are doing work in other countries as well. Um, this program is really focused on our FYIs here, and I hope that each one of these young people will go back to their own home states. And I know, Ian, you've already done this with the Louisiana leadership that's got its eyes on you already, the governor's office and a lot of the lead folks. But I hope you all will all go back and connect 
um, to your powerful faith-based groups in your state or to your local or state governments and use the voice uh, that you have um, so beautifully developed uh, here uh, through our program this summer and continue to be an advocate for children in your situation uh, so that we can all together improve our child welfare system. And I wanna just close by thanking um, Nancy Blackwell, our new extraordinary CCAI director. Nancy, you just sort of hit the ground running and poor Nancy, the week she showed up to go to work, we shut the office down. <laughs> so poor Nancy has had to, you know, just sort of take all of our programs in a whole different way, but our donors have been so helpful and supportive. And I wanna just thank Kate and Taylor and Erica, our great wishes for you, sweetheart, as you go back to, um, to law school and congratulations, headed off to Harvard. We're really proud of you. Um, and again, just thank the staff. Nancy, you did a beautiful job and uh, we look forward to seeing you all. And just to close, reminder that our FYI, no, our Angels in Adoption program will be virtual September 23rd. I thank all the board of directors, particularly Susan Neely and Rita Lewis, who are co-chairing that effort again uh, this year. I wanna thank Russ Sullivan, our board member, who's our leader for our foster youth uh, internship program. Russ, your leadership is just invaluable and all the board members that helped. And Susan and um, Rita, thank you for your leadership in Angels. So let's all, um, you know, just, um, think about what we learned in this last hour and a half. You know, thank the Lord for the many blessings he's given each one of us, even though it's been difficult for so many of us in so much trauma in individual ways. But, you know, God gives us each our own individual gifts and let's just put those to the great use of building a much better, much more compassionate, much more supportive, um, much more uh, permanent with permanency in mind for every child in America that needs a safe and loving and nurturing home and an education and support so they can develop their own God-given gifts. And that's what we at CCI believe. We know you believe it too, or you wouldn't be on this line. So again, we thank the members of Congress for stepping up and going beyond by helping and nurturing a foster youth intern, our future leaders of tomorrow. So God bless you all, and I'll turn it back to Nancy. Thank you all for attending. Um, thank you to the staff and to the foster youth interns for this great presentation. Uh, in the invitations that you all got, there is a link to a PDF version of the presentation. Um, I hope that you all were tweeting using our hashtags for today. This uh, event has been recorded. It was live streamed on our Facebook. It will also be linked on our Twitter in case anybody wants to go back and look at it again. Thank you all for attending. I hope everyone gets home safely in DC. It is a horrific storm. Luckily, our internet lasted throughout the entire event. Um, and we will talk with you soon. Thank you again.